Hi, everybody. I am Mark Ostrick of OstrickProductions.com. I'm a filmmaker and three-time open-heart surgery survivor. You may be asking yourself, why am I live right now on the American Sleep Apnea Association's uh, Facebook page? And that's because I have been making videos with the ASAA for uh, the last several months, and I am honored and happy to be working with uh, a friend and also a uh, survivor and liver, uh, uh, someone that lives with sleep apnea, uh, Adam Amder. And uh, Adam Amder is the chief patient officer of the American Sleep Apnea Association. And uh, we're really happy to have uh, a dis him here today. We're going to have a discussion about somebody with a chronic, um, basically a congenital heart uh, disease, uh, tetralogy of flow, um, with a, a chronic patient, somebody that's been living with sleep apnea, uh, for their whole lives, even though they may not have known it for their whole lives. So, Adam, great to see you. Uh, you know, I'm glad to be participating in this series. Mark, thank you for uh, for uh, coming on live and uh, getting in front of the camera and uh, getting out from behind. Uh, I know your story as, as a patient advocate, as, as a survivor and as a thriver uh, has gone back a long way uh, and I know has affected, you know, the career paths that you have chosen as a result of your film background and where you dedicated your, your, your focus and your time. And, uh, you know, what we, we at the American Sleep Apnea Association like to surround ourselves with patients from all sorts of walks of life that, that have the experiences that we can draw on. And while we've had this, this long-term chronic uh, incremental decline of a disease that most of us don't ever know that we have until uh, some major sort of life event happens, uh, you knew early on at a young age that you had a serious problem and that there had to be a major, major, major interventions to deal with it. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I grew up as a child of, of a father who had triple bypass, open bypass when, when he was 38 years old when I was just six. And so I always grew up with the fear of, of my heart and, 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 and taking care of it. And, and as a result, my father became very, very, uh, uh, I don't want to say obsessive, but he, he, he got the, the running bug, the, the workout bug, the tennis workout bug, not, but not in the 80s or the 90s. I'm talking in the mid-70s. Uh, and as a result, we always grew up, you know, with movement, with exercise and being very active outside, especially living in Florida, since we're both from, from the South Florida area. Um, and at the same time, we also ate a very low salt diet. So all these years I was doing all this preventative stuff, taking statins and doing all this stuff when it, the, the whole time what I didn't know is I was self-suffocating myself at night and I wasn't getting oxygen. I was, I was poisoning myself with CO2 and it was happening slowly but surely and so slowly that I didn't even know it was happening to me because it was by normal. So I think... Um I, I, you know, for me, it's, it's weird. It's like we were on different vectors, right? Like I, I started out uh, at one month old, them diagnosing me with um, this heart defect because my lips were blue and my fingernails were blue. So I wasn't getting enough oxygen. And, and um, I had sleep apnea in my medical files because of the lack of oxygen um, that was, you know, that was from my heart. So Immediately after the first surgery, when I was four, which happened on July seventh, nineteen seventy-seven, which was the luckiest day of the century, uh, seven seven seventy seven, um, my my mom, when she saw me just after surgery, uh, she almost fainted with all the tubes and everything. But the doctor said, "Look, look at his lips. Look at his nails. They're pink now." So from that moment on, after my surgery, I pretty much had a normal. Um, childhood. My only restriction was no competitive contact sports at the time. I couldn't play sports where there was a coach saying harder, push harder, do an extra three laps around the track. I kind of had to be my own self-monitor. And over the years, that's kind of changed in a way because now it's they recommend daily cardiovascular. Uh, they don't want me doing heavy weights, low reps. You know, if I'm going to do weights, they want it to be light, light weights, lots of reps. Um, uh, yeah, but I, I can remember my mother telling me that uh, my father's father, she remembers when they first got married that they said, you know, he had a heart condition. He just had to sit in a chair all day. Don't move. Just stay. You know, that was that was that was the intervention. That was the the, the, the medical advice. And now, you you know, all these years later, it was be active for you. It was just don't get physical. Whereas I was the, the kid, you know, growing up, I was as physical and I was the youngest of three brothers and playing, trying to keep up and playing with everyone. And and. and 
I never knew that I couldn't get a runner's high. My mouth was always wide open. I never understood why it took me so long to recover after a game or why the next two or three days I couldn't get my body going. I didn't realize I was really running that marathon before I ever even got to the game. Did um, you even did you even know what um, sleep apnea was at that point in your life? When when was it that the you first even heard the word sleep apnea? My mother in law uh, was at our house when when my daughter was just born. She had come flown in from Pennsylvania, and she looked at my my wife while they were doing the early night feedings, and she said, "Okay." Hold on. Your yeah. daughter was, so this is 12 years ago. This is 2007 now. So you didn't, you were, you were in your thirties at this 30, point. 35. Yeah. That's shocking. And, and and what would you say the percentage of people out there that uh, when they get diagnosed with this as an adult, is, is this, a, is this an outlier case or a lot of people in the same boat? I'm an outlier and, and as far as the extreme, how bad my apnea is. And I used to tell people if I didn't come from a family of means or some, some, some way of putting food on my table, I probably would have been dead or in prison long ago. Uh, but as far as where I'm in common with, with everybody in this, in this boat together, since this, this, this disease, just like the COVID issue right now, doesn't discriminate, uh, most of our patients, according to the medical literature, go 10 to 15 years before they're ever even diagnosed. And that's a big moment and point to get that diagnosis and sort of, you know, for me, it was like, wow, it wasn't even that I got the diagnosis. I got the intervention at the same time. I was like, this is an amazing feeling I'm feeling. Now, if I didn't yeah. have that initial first positive reaction from getting the intervention, I don't think we'd be sitting here right now having this conversation, quite honestly. Has there ever been any kind of discussion or um, talk about... Um, IQ and just overall uh, intelligence, because I, I remember uh, having a conversation with my doctor saying, yeah, that those first four years when I had apnea, and, you know, my lips were blue and not enough oxygen going through my body that it, there probably are a few IQ points, maybe a little bit of height that I might have lost. Um, any any th talk on that? Uh, I don't know if you can see over my shoulder, but there's the great Dr. Christian Gimeno who passed away this past summer. And uh, when I first went into his clinic, wow, almost almost 11 years ago now at, 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 down at Stanford, you know, he said to me, he goes, you're really lucky that you had your adenoids out when you were two years old. He goes, because by the time you're, you're when this disease really started to take effect on me, that where we noticed the symptoms were really affecting my quality of life was as I went through puberty, my airway never stopped, stopped growing. What are adenoids? Adenoids are like two little, uh, if you think of wine cork bottles that are up underneath this bone that sort of block your, your nasal airway and pathway, but not on the surface, back deep in your, your, your nasal pharynx. We only think of our nose out here. We don't realize that our nose and our air, upper airway goes all the way through to the back of our head over our spine. Wow. And, 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 and is that something that has to happen when you're young or does it, if you've, cause you know, we're both of the similar tribe. We're, and we're, so, well, you know, we have uh, sinus issues. You could hear it in my voice that I'm, I have sinus issues. You hear it in voice and you can see it in people's eyes when they, when they're, the darker the eyes are, it's not how tired you are. It literally means your skin is not getting oxygen. So uh, our generation having your tonsils and adenoids out was a common thing. Uh, in today's walk of life, you know, you would tell a parent that you, you need to go do a surgical intervention. They're going to do everything in their possibility uh, to avoid going down that, that pathway uh, if they can avoid putting their child under anesthesia or, 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 or the risk of surgery. But the truth of the matter is we did this to my daughter when she was two years old. We were, she was diagnosed at two. So, I, you know, I was diagnosed when she was six months old. It took a year and a half before I put my mask, my mask on first before I realized, oh, my God, she has the same problem. And so, um, you know, so, sorry, no, so you find out in your thirties, your daughter is born, you get diagnosed, your mother-in-law kind of alerts you to the fact. And then, or, 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 and then a, a friend of yours, as I remember you telling me, once you realize that you have this, this underlying condition that you've chronic condition, you've had your whole life, uh, how long was it before the, the transition uh, to getting a CPAP? 
So literally, uh, and I'll, I'll say this is in the pre-COVID world, um, I had my sleep study at a, the top of the Best Western Hotel in Japantown in San Francisco. And the top of the floor of the Best Western Hotel, it, it was part of the University of California, San Francisco sleeping uh, uh, sleep clinic. And I literally got to go to a hotel and it was just like any other hotel with your TV and room service and anything else. But I was hooked up for a sleep study. Now, before mm -hmm. I fell asleep, the sleep tech told me, goes, if you stop breathing a certain amount of times, I'm going to come in and, and, and put this mask on you and we're going to titrate you. Now, the reason they do that is one, because they realize you're, you're in jeopardy and two, they want to treat you. But, you know, if we, if we put on the cynical hat for a second, uh, because you're on hospital property, they have to treat you. If they know right, that you're, you're severely ill, you could die on their premises. So they put the CPAP machine on you. So it was, it was, you had an extreme case and, and, uh, Thank God you got tested and you're, you're, you, you, I mean, this became a, a, a cause for you and, and we're here now talking and we're actually live. This is actually the, uh, one of the first live events that we're doing. And it's a great, great, uh, experience to be able to do this live and, and actually start getting questions from the, the audience. I just saw one come across, uh, from Leah Harris and saying, are there any particular considerations since we are living in the age of COVID now? Um, regarding COVID and CPAP users, and I think that's a that's a great question. And let's 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 go there. Go there. Uh, so great question, Leah. Uh, the, the the biggest issue that I'm having, and that we've been trying to get out in the messaging and interviewing specialists and experts from around the country, is okay. I don't know whether or not I had the virus. Uh, it's, it appears that we should all assume that everyone has it at this point, whether you're symptomatic or not, uh, and we're all doing physical distance, which is going to, is going to keep this thing, you know, as they say, the curve uh, flattened and keep it from, from spreading out so we can all catch our breath and figure out how we're going to manage this pandemic. There are always going to be viral pandemics, but us. How are you more susceptible though and to, to, to the disease? Do they know yet? Do they know you're more susceptible or they, is that just of other conditions that you may have? They, they know we're susceptible in that anybody that has a sleep breathing disorder issue or chronic one usually has a some sort of compromised immune system at some point of their life. Uh, when your sleep is poor or inefficient or fragmented, your immune system is, is, is broken down. So if you happen to get the virus and you have sleep apnea and you're not treating it. Immunity. It's your immune system's already down because your sleep is disturbed. And if your sleep is disturbed, you're not at, at, at a great chance to fight that, fight that disease off. Um, I'm Stacy Johnston now is asking, does heart disease cause sleep apnea? Which I think is a great, great question. Um, <laughs> do you know anything about this? And, uh, you know, we could talk about it a little bit. So this is a favorite subject for the researchers and the clinicians and, and the different specialties, because we like to say nobody owns the airway. Um, so does heart disease cause sleep apnea or does sleep apnea cause heart disease? It's the classic chicken or the egg. Airway means the airway in your throat or the airways meaning the, our way of communication. Ah, that's a whole nother thing I now have to clarify. I mean the airways in your throat. Our airway actually starts from the apex of our nose or upper airway all the way down to here. So our community does not just have sleep apnea because they're obese or just have a big neck. It could be if their chin is recessed. Uh, it could be if they have a high upper palate, uh, if they have sinus issues. There's, there's all sorts of reasons why you could be a mouth breather, why you could be stop breathing in your night. Uh, you could have reflux. Uh, reflux, yeah. In my case, it was a heart disease. It was a heart issue. My heart was not as strong. It was causing me to stop breathing in my, my sleep. And it was a huge, I mean, obviously I wasn't aware of this cause I was a baby, but it was a huge concern. Um, and I think they have shown this now. I am not a doctor or medical professional, but they have shown that sleep apnea in young, young children could be an, a sign of an underlying bigger problem. Is, is, would you say that's correct? It's no doubt that it could be. It's, 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 this is an, an issue that we go from pregnant moms who potentially could be hypoxic in their third trimester and the ramifications of that for the mother and for the child in utero, uh, all the way towards, you know, every mother, every new, new mother in the world is, is worried about their child in SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, uh, which is a syndrome, which is, there's really a lot of potential reasons why babies have SIDS. 
Uh, and then there's pediatric sleep apnea. And Dr. Gimeno used to tell me, he goes, really, you know, really the only difference is that a, a, a one-year-old baby can roll over and catch its breath. And unfortunately, as, as horrific as this to say, is, is not self-suffocate. Um, and, and that's, you know, I, I know they, they predict my apnea. So are they saying SIDS too. is there's a connection between SIDS and, and apnea potentially? Very, very much. A lot of SIDS is considered uh, pediatric sleep apnea. Not all of it. There are mm -hmm. other genetic and other issues why, why kids, the brain doesn't tell a child to breathe. Uh, but for a lot of children, it, it's, it's literally as simple as something as pediatric sleep apnea. Now, when you, you, you get diagnosed, you're, you must have felt some kind of uh, <laughs> anger, rage, I don't know, like disbelief that you're at this age and you're getting diagnosed now. You know, um, how much, you know, you're the chief patient officer of this organization. I take it you, like other patient advocates out there, there, there must have been a lot of self-education that, that you had to go through um, to yeah. get to where you are. How long did that, where did you go from like, oh my God, I have sleep apnea to like, this is going to be, I need to get up, up to date on this. And, you know, this is a bigger problem. Like you stumbled onto almost like the story. My, my story is, is very much that of uh, Mr. Magoo meets Forrest Gump meets uh, Inspector Clouseau. And, and I very much, uh, you know, that first night I was so severe in that hospital setting, they put that intervention on me. And, and I will quite honestly tell you, and I've said this in many interviews before, it was the best drug I ever had. I had a great initial reaction. I popped up out of bed at six in the morning and I wanted to race home. And I was so happy because after 35 years, I finally had my Oprah aha moment. I knew what was wrong with me all those years. I knew how I was supposed to feel when I woke up, like I was reborn. Uh, and not from a religious aspect, literally my brain got the first good night's sleep it probably had gotten in since I felt like I was 10 years old, uh, pre pre pubescent. And so after that, I honestly became drug seeking and the drug of choice was sleep apnea, it was a CPAP machine. Now let's go back to the, 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 the pre COVID healthcare system. And that is, I had to wait two weeks before my insurance kicked in before I could even get my machine. But the So that must have been a rough two weeks, man. I mean, if you had a taste of uh, the machine and, you know. At that point, it was the worst two weeks of my life. Um, so so I, I hate to be jumping around, but I'm, I'm just so curious, you know. There are so many home device, home things that people could could buy to help them with breathing. Vicks Vapor Rub, this that. You know, there's so many people that have this issue. Can CPAP machines be used for? Uh, you know, should it be a general consumer product? What's your thought on that, or is it? Uh, why let, is let, let's be clear: neither you nor I are medical doctors, but both you and I have been through this healthcare system uh, more times than, than most people could ever count, and 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 have come out on thank God on the other end that be able to have a conversation like this. Uh, I like to tell people that it's harder to get a CPAP machine than it is to get guns or narcotics. What? Uh, Can you say that again, please? It's harder to get a CPAP machine than it is to get a license for a gun. Now, is that true or is that hyperbole? Well, that's fact. Um, you literally have to go through the system, go to a sleep doctor, have a sleep study ordered for you, whether it's in lab or now everything will be forced to be home sleep study, which is a whole other conversation we could have on another mm -hmm. day on the ramifications of that for public health. And Do you feel industry. that it should be a common use object that, that people. Uh, so or, you, you brought up, you brought up a product before. What do you do to clear your airways? Do you put on a breathe right strip? Do you use Vakes vapor rub? Are right. you taking an allergy medicine? Most of these are over the counter. When you go to your local drugstore, there is no Correct. reason you can't go to a, a drugstore and try it before you buy it and get one of these machines, which are only a vacuum blower with an algorithm and take it home and see if this intervention works for you. Cause guess what? It's a lot less invasive than taking a drug. Right. And I didn't even know what CPAP meant, right? CPAP just means continuous pressure, uh, continuous positive airway pressure. Right. And that's, you know, I'm learning positive. about this as, you know, continue positive means it's pushing you, pushing air into your face. So that let's your bring nose that back, and your throat. Let, let's bring that back to the COVID concerns for people yeah. and for the professionals and for our patients. It's the Can we come back? I, I'm yeah. just noticing that we're getting a bunch of more questions, which is, which is great. So, um, uh, uh, Latika Collins is asking, where can I get a CPAP machine if I'm paying out of pocket? Hmm. 
So up until this, this in, in, insane crisis that we're all living through right now, we used to have our CPAP assistance program and we used to ask people to send us their gently used or their old machines to our, to our fulfillment center in Minnesota. Obviously, uh, everyone can see on the news every second, every hour of the day that there's a shortage of not only ventilators, but they're converting BiPAPs, AutoPAPs, and CPAPs now uh, to help these hospitals. So the best thing I, I could tell you is, is uh, right now, that's where they're going to go. That's where the manufacturers are making them for. They're, those are the front line as far in our, is in our biological uh, war on, on COVID. Um, it's going to be to help the front line people first. What is a, how much does a CPAP machine cost? Uh, if you have insurance, um, depending upon your deductibles, uh, you can go online and, and, and get a, a new one retailed, to, let's say almost uh, $750. 750 right. if with insurance. Without insurance, out of pocket, how much does it retail for? You want to go buy one on Amazon you, you can, or through you ResMed get, if you have you, a prescription. You cannot buy from the device companies. They, because of Stark laws, the sleep doctors are not allowed to sell these machines. So a lot you of hurdles. Of, a lot of hurdles, a lot of obstructions, a lot of barriers. You have to go usually through your durable medical equipment company, which could be either in person in a brick and mortar store, which that model now goes out the window, or it'll be they send a machine to your home and you auto titrate, you auto set up the exact pressures that you need to be at to get proper therapy. So how much does it cost out of pocket? It costs a couple thousand dollars when it's said and done because it's not only the machine, the hardware, it's the resupplies, it's the tubes, it's the filters, it's the humidifier, it's the how much how expensive are they to make? Uh, there's literally open source literature that we can make these machines with $35 worth of parts from your local hardware store. So I'm getting other questions. Can sleep apnea cause PVCs? Can you explain what that is? PVC and increased, uh, heart rhythm issues. <laughs> uh, there is no doubt. Um, and I'm not the one to, to quote the literature on this, but I think it, it's anywhere. And I'm, this is a safe guesstimate. I'm going to give you that 75 to 80% of all AFib patients or atrial fibrillation have an undiagnosed, untreated sleep disorder breathing issue before they ever get to the AFib diagnosis. Wow. So they've been living with it for a while. I mean, that's, it's, it's wreaked havoc in your system already. Yeah. It, it's important yeah. to say that sleep apnea really is an end of the road disease, just like AFib, uh, just like a lot of these things. And that's why if we come back to my child and the early recognition, we can prevent a lot of these co-occurring comorbidities that are that are that are that are a stress on our society and so you're seeing people now coming back to the covid they're scared to use their cpap machine because it has positive airway pressure maybe nice. that, that 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 ventilation from your machine is going to exhaust if you had the virus the virus that's why they don't want to use it in the hospital settings people i see are getting, people are getting ventilated which gives them negative pressure that way this it's not being aerosol it's inside and um pvc is premature ventricular con contraction is that I leave that to you as the hard. Effort, okay. But we do it. have just so, you know, we um, talking to our Facebook audience, we do have people in the chat room that are part of the sleep apnea association that will be uh, responding uh, to specific questions. Uh, if, if we can't respond to them right now, live while we're doing the show. Um, so Laura McDonald's asking, will I always have sleep apnea? Can I lose weight and do another sleep study? It's a great question, Laura. Uh, Yes, losing weight will help you prevent the severity of your sleep apnea, but will not eliminate it. Uh, we can lose weight on our, our face and our body, but uh, there's a lot of science that's saying that the tongue doesn't actually ever lose the fat, the fat deposits. Uh, and for most people, this is a tongue disorder, which is obstructing the airway. My tongue is literally too big for my mouth. Uh, I, have a, I have the mouth of a five-year-old with, with my daughter and I, and we should do this one day more. Uh, I'm not going to joke. Uh, you set me up for a joke, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> well, that, that's very, that's very mature of you and, and, and me for not, for not going on top of that. But <laughs> as I said, my daughter will, will bite into an apple now. Uh, and she's uh, 12 years old and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm mid forties and her bite is now twice as wide as mine. Um, and that's because we have intervened with her in her treatment from age of two. We've expanded her airway, her mouth with orthodontia, with, with surgery, uh, and to come back to another, another symptom, you said your doctors told you when you were younger that you weren't going to grow as much. We know that the growth hormone, if you're getting proper sleep in children is in the, is, is 
hap is produced in the first third of the sleep in the night. So that these sleep, kids that, right? Sleep, uh, diet, exercise are kind of the three pillars of health. Would you say that's? Yeah, the, it's, it's it's the three pillars of wellness of of prevention, uh, and there's no money to be made in it. Uh, that's why this is a disease that has to go through so many barriers before you ever get to there. We could prevent a lot of this. We don't need to spend billions and trillions of dollars on looking for cures for sleep apnea when we know we can prevent most of this. I'm not advocating and saying CPAP is the therapy, the cure all. CPAP is 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 it's the, a band aid. It's it's helping people that have diagnosed their. But but for your daughter, for example, the expander that she 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 may she may not need a CPAP machine and grow up she with with having she, she, since her last what they call hose heads, right? Is that a yeah. common term? Hose heads. Uh, I mean, there's there's all sorts of funny little vernacular for 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 uh, for husbands and wives and, and bed partners that are wearing their wearing their hose. But my daughter, yeah, she used to go to sleepaway camp with her CPAP, but had no stigma. That no stigma. Now she's 12 years old. She's been off her CPAP now for almost, I think, six months to a year. Uh, and, and how's her sleep? And how's it going? It's pretty good. Now, does she have some residual apnea? Yeah. Is it is it uh, an AHI of what they would say, like one or two? She have one episode an hour or two, probably, uh, but it's not affecting her quality of life. Now, if she started getting sick, if her behavior changed, if her mood, I would say to my daughter, sure. I said, why, yeah. you, why, why, why maybe put the mask back on? You might feel better. And she knows. She could tell you, oh, wow, this is what it's like to wake up again. So maybe on one of the next shows, if she's open to it, we could have a, we could have a chat with her. I'm, I'm sure it would be very eye-opening to a lot of people yeah. to hear a 12-year-old's perspective on, on this chronic disease. Now, I, we are getting some more questions. One is uh, from Geneva, uh, Christian uh, Bernard. Uh, why are CPAP users with sleep apnea part of the risk group? I'm feeling really great with my CPAP. It does what it's uh, m- meant to do on me. So why are they saying it's a, it's, it's a great question, Geneva? It's it, it, you're exactly right. Uh, using it is the best prevention you can use at home. Uh, God forbid you have the virus, isolate yourself from anyone else in the house. Uh, but using it was going to give you a strong immune system. It's going to prevent the cardiac issues. And we're hearing first, first, first anecdotal uh, information from critical care and ICU doctors around the country that the rate of heart attacks is through the roof right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, some of the vascular uh, surgeons that I know are, are, are doing record amounts of stents right now. Uh, and that's yes, because people are under stress. And yes, this is, this is a new world for all of us to be in confinement. But of all the disease groups in the world that are used to being physically distanced and socially isolated, it's sleep deprived, cognitively deprived sleep apnea patients. It's, it's, it's scary. I mean, uh, like Keith Collins here is saying, I have a prescription, but I lost my machine because I didn't meet the nightly requirements. What, what does that mean? This, 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 I don't want to say this field, but this, 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 this healthcare system that we had going into COVID and what will come out of it after is, I think will look completely different. And I think it might be one of the positive shining lights that those of us that are, that so you could actually of, lose your machine if you're not, if if, if, the, if, if, if if according to Medicare, you don't use your machine 70% of the time uh, or more than four hours a night in the first 90 days of you getting that machine with 30 days continuous of using it 70% of the time with that four hours a night, they can come to your house and take that machine away. Now, if you think about that, it's that's so beyond unethical. And, and actually, I, I have no problem saying criminal because if you had diabetes med, uh, diagnosis, and they give you diabetes education, which was reimbursed by, by the healthcare system and by your insurer. Um, if you weren't using your diabetes medicine and you were on Medicare, they'd come to your house and they ask you why. They'll give you diabetes education. They want to know why you're not using your meds. Same for hypertension meds, which it comes back to COVID. This is, it appears that a, a hypertension and high blood pressure appear to be rampant amongst the people that are really having a hard time with this virus. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think we'll learn a lot about it coming out of it. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's pretty crazy to think that, uh, you know, people that have sinus issues like that, that you, you, you with your expertise and the knowledge seeking, you know, journey that, that you went on, you, you, you feel pretty confident when you look at somebody, hear somebody talk, you, you, yeah. you can tell if they're sleep deprived, have some kind of apnea, um, how long did that take before you kind of were like starting to recognize that? 
Well, my, my, my medical friends were all doctor friends. Oh, you have uh, Munchausen's. You think everybody has uh, apnea now when I first said, okay, I, I give you that. That makes sense. Um, but the truth is, don't listen to me. I'm the non-reliable narrator. I, I'm, I'm the patient who's had this my whole life. Listen, listen to the experts. Listen to the bed partner. The most objective way to diagnose apnea is that bed partner. If that e bed partner is elbowing you, that's objective proof that you're interrupting their sleep and that you are snoring so loud that you woke them up or that they can't even go to sleep. But snoring so, is not breath holding, correct? Snoring is partial obstruction. It's hypoxia. You could be limiting the airflow to your brain. And if you're not using your nose, you, you know, you're using your mouth and you're not clearing the CO2. And it's a vicious potential cycle that we, that we create and you become a short, shallow breather. That's so it's a, re it's, a re it's a restriction in your airflow. The snoring is actually, it's like, it's a warning. It's a warning. It's a big warning. This is amazing. So, you know, your, your journey uh, continues, right? I mean, it's your journey will, will continue. Um, where do you hope to be? You know, is there, is there an end for your treatment, there is no cure, right? You're just basic. Where where are you right now? I, I, I am I am very content and happy with inside my HEPA filtered home. I literally have a clean home, which I was my immune system was so weak when I first we first moved to this house years ago that that was my bigger fear. Um, <clears throat> but I now live in a clean home. My child is healthy. My marriage is healthy, and my wife and I once we put on our mask. We helped our child, and then, as they say on an airplane, we start, started helping others around us. Uh, did right. we know that you got to put your mask on first before before you help others? Now, now, if you're snoring, I'm I'm seeing that, that that's really like what you would say is a cousin of of sleep apnea because it's it's uh it, it's basically restrictive it, airflow. It's it's the, it's, it's the it's the canary. Let's let's say, call it what it is. It, it's it's that warning system that hey, if you don't start listening to it. This isn't right. Oh, I just snore when I drink. Well, if you're drinking every night, guess what? You're snoring every night. So then you're right. having a hypopsia, hypopnea and, and, and your brain's not getting oxygen. And this is a vicious cycle where we start to self-medicate, which you're seeing a lot of right now as people are at home and confined. People are taking sedatives. Sedatives re relax breathing. They'll make the apnea worse. So, every, oh, I have anxiety. I need Xanax or Ativan. You're playing Russian roulette at that point. Hmm. Craig, we just got another question in from uh, um, Alexandra um, Harper saying, have there been any medical studies that you know of linking problematic gut bacteria and sleep apnea? Uh, I'm not the one, the go-to person to, to, to quote you the literature on this, but I know there's a lot of work going on with the GI correlation. And I think you'll see as a result, and that'll be one of the positive things that come out of this whole COVID-19 pandemic is the correlation between sleep, breathing, oxygen, and all the organ systems, whether it's our heart, whether it's our kidneys and the endocrine and the diabetes, the mental health component in our brain, uh, the GI system and the reflux, you name it, we're going to find that there's a chicken and egg to all of this and that they all affect each other one way or another. And GI is gastrointestinal? Yes. yes. And so, um, that's your gut. That's your gut. So trust your gut. Right. So because we have uh, neuroreceptors there, we have um, we have them in the mouth. I mean, let, let's think about this. Our healthcare system in the States is set up that dental and medical insurance are two different things. Yeah. So we are, we are, it's, it's crazy. And so we are getting some, some chatter in, in our group from some of our uh, other members here that are saying it does impact the GI system. If you have apnea, it can, it can get in the way. I guess it can get in the way of almost everything. If you're not sleeping, right? Mood. I, how, how big does mood play in all of well, this? Well, Before we even get into the mood, I'll come back to the GI. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a lot of good information out there that, that reflux or silent reflux, which I had for my whole life. I never realized it. Uh, was my brain's way of saying, hey, you're not breathing at night, so let's send a signal to your stomach, shoot the acid up your esophagus, so, so it literally opened up the obstruction. But what people don't realize is what happens, especially with children, is that that acid never makes it all the way up. It winds up in the lungs. So therefore, you have a higher potential of asthma and allergy issues. Uh, oh, my gosh. Your, body's, wow. your body will protect you. Children will protect themselves. You're, you're seeing a lot of stuff with COVID that if you don't have a ventilator, they're putting these people in the prone positions to let them drain. We literally, the first red flag for my daughter at two years old that we now know in hindsight that we didn't know was the real, the glaring red flag, but she was sleeping in child's position. 
Child's position, meaning like just the butt up, butt, butt up like, in the air, yoga position. She was forcing air into her diaphragm, letting her tongue fall forward, naturally protecting herself. And 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 you're saying this. Um, this isn't um, this is hyperbole or anything, or you know, this this is no. Like I said, I, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not an MD, but I fortunately was treated by the guy who founded the field of medicine, who created the so-called AHI, who I think was more a pioneer and, and a cutthroat when it's said and done, because he was, I think was 10, 20 years ahead of most of the fields. And I think will be proven right in a lot of his theories and, 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 and research that he was doing. But at the end of the day, once I got into his team, into his vision, into his experience and wisdom level, my life changed. Therefore, my, my daughter's life changed. The life of my family changed, and I was able to start helping other people around me. He trained 90 fellows that came out of the Stanford Sleep Clinic. So I can't say I'm a fellow, but that's who I learned from. Right. You're self-taught. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we'll come back and have more conversations. I, I know we're running a little short on time, but, you know, I, I guess for a shameless plug, you know, we see PAP Appreciation Day is, is coming up. There's lots of videos that uh, you you we're making here to educate this community, whether you've had sleep apnea for, for one year or 10 years or 20 years. Um, you know, we're really excited to share uh, content with you. You could find this on uh, sleepapnea.com in the video uh, section. No, not .com, .org. Do sleep sleepapnea.com, Mark, let's remember, is one of the manufacturer's uh, websites that plays off of ours. Sleepapnea.org. Yes. sleepapnea.org and uh, we'll follow up in the chat with some links. Um, once again, thanks a lot, Adam. I'm, I'm really happy that we could be working together. Uh, as full disclosure, we both grew up in, in, in Miami and, and both kind of appreciate, um, you know, we both have appreciation for a love of, of, of film, of health, science, technology, and, uh, you know, Facebook, you know, I, I would say is the credit that we're working together and we've stayed in touch over these years. And so, uh, you know, you know, I'm glad that we could be contributing and, and helping patients and, you know, thank you. And uh, do you have any other final thoughts before uh, I, we end I, up talk? Yeah, I have. So, I mean, this has been an amazing experience to go through with, with a lot of my friends, you know, that I started out in the film business and in the film world out. And I thought that's what I wanted to be. And and, not, I, you know, my first film was a euthanasia film, and I didn't realize I was a patient advocate before I ever knew one, and I was scared to release it. And, and just to come, you know, I always knew I, we wanted to collaborate together. There was many projects, but to come back around, and now we're bringing the best of all these projects, and they all still have life, and they all still have a purpose for the stories that we're telling, whether it's about the heart, the mind, our families, about children. You know, we're, 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 we're at the same level, we're at the same, you know, age range. It's our generation that's going to be in charge of, of of bridging uh, this older generation and this younger generation that, that are in the midst of, of trying to rip each other's heads off. Um, yeah. we're, we're left in charge of raising the children and taking care of mom and dad at the same time right now. Um, well, you know, thank you so much. I want to thank you. I want to thank um, everybody that watched. I want to thank everyone that asked a question. I hope, hopefully we got to everyone's question. We'll be back doing this again. Um, and we'd love to hear from you, get your feedback and uh, be safe out there. You know, stay home, stay safe. Uh, check in with your with the CDC and all, all the your local health uh, government agencies about what's happening in your in your community re regarding COVID, and uh, hope you and your families uh, stay safe. Um, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Bye bye.